Hi everybody and welcome <laughs> welcome to another one of my interviews here on Instagram live. Yay! I'm very excited. I'm freaking nervous, but I'm always nervous. <laughs> Hi! Hi, how are you? I'm doing well and you? I'm good. I'm really, really good. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for accepting again. <laughs> And also, before I forget, um, I wanted to congratulate you for your pregnancy. I Thank you. Like, I'm, we're pretty far time. along these days. So we're, big. <laughs> we're getting there. I know. It's like three weeks or less. So any time now really is fine. But, you know, maybe she should keep cooking a little longer because it's good for them. <laughs> <laughs> I literally like, commented on all of your posts when you, when you announced it. <laughs> but... Now that I have you here, like I wanted to tell you, like in person. Well, in person. thank you. Yeah, in person, virtually, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I um, I was saying to my husband, I was like, I want to like document it on here a little bit because I was like, so many of my fans, if they're they're a little bit younger than like they wouldn't have friends that are pregnant yet or whatever, and so it's like not quite their time of life yet, and so I was like, it'll be kind of interesting to them to see like how that all fits into the grand scheme of things as a performer and everything. So I was like, well, I'll just put pictures up and here's a squishy baby face and whatever, you know. <laughs> and you also like did some performances with pregnant. Like Yes, that was very interesting to perform that yeah. pregnant. I, ne I never did with my daughter. I was, I think I was four months or four and a half months with my last pregnancy. That was the last time I performed in a show. So I really wasn't showing yet. And this time it was like, I need to find gowns that I can put a belly in and still breathe and sing. And so it was very, it was fun uh, to do that. And then we had a few songs that tipped the hat a little bit to being pregnant, you know, uh, and, and having families and stuff just to like, I don't know, go with the joke. I love that. <laughs> so I have like a few questions for you. <laughs> I have quite a lot actually. <laughs> Good, that's good. <laughs> I have like, um, like kind of more general questions. And then I have like some questions kind of related to opera. So mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Perfect. And let me know if my AC is too loud or anything. It's just really warm here still. So I have my air conditioning going. So if it gets loud and you can't hear me, you just let me know. It's fine for now. Like, okay. I can't really hear it. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so, um, my first question that I have for you is um, how or when uh, did you realize that you wanted to be an actress? I realized it when I was quite young. I was only 12 when I was like, I'm going to be an opera singer. So I think that's probably on the young side for most people, especially um, specifically picking opera. But uh, when you're inspired by good singers and good singing, then uh, it's not too early to get bitten by the performing bug for sure. Yeah, my fa I really love opera and like it's kind of weird for my age to like opera and like yeah. my whole family is like how why do you like opera like because nobody in my family actually listens to opera like they never did and like nobody around me either so it's like really weird. <laughs> and that's amazing. Like, like you're so young to like opera or like they say that's like for old people. Yeah, but you know what? The problem is if we always uh, if we always leave it for old people, then eventually the audiences will die out. So we always need young people being introduced to opera, like you and I, so that we keep the art form um, alive through um, through being in it, through patronizing the opera by going and sitting in the audience or watching the live streams and stuff like that. So it's it's actually really important to like keep it going because it's so cool and it'd be such a loss if it if it weren't um, continuing to be like fed with new audiences. Mm -hmm. um, now that you mentioned like before about inspirations, I was wondering like, who are you inspired by? Or well, what? yeah, I have a lot of inspirations. I have some living inspirations and some that have already passed on because of course there's always like opera singers and performers that I've like loved and listened to a lot. Um, like Joan Sutherland, I just, love her voice and on a mofo um some of the ones that are still alive like leontine price is one of my favorite opera singers she's still alive but she is definitely um older she's not like in the public eye anymore or anything like that but she's just 
she's the best Aida that ever existed. So Leontine Price, people, look her up if you've never heard her. Her pianissimo high notes are just like heaven, like touching the earth. Um, and then in terms of uh, musical theater influences, I have a lot of them, but um, definitely uh, um, Marnie Nixon, who, who did voiceover work to do like My Fair Lady and um, West Side Story and stuff like that. You didn't usually see her on film, but her voice was just like, just amazing. She was in The Sound of Music. She's one of the nuns in The Sound of Music. And of course, Julie Andrews is like a huge, huge influence for me. So more recently, I feel like um, people like um, Jesse Mueller, like I just adore her voice. It's so so individual it doesn't sound like anybody else and i just like love that about it it's like so um easy to like fall in love with that voice so people like that it's like it's a real smorgasbord between like strictly opera people like anomofo and like jesse mueller but somehow it all just like comes together i feel like in the same idea which is just that good singing is good singing no matter what genre you're in um did you ever consider going into anything other than theater? Not super seriously. I mean, when I was a little, little girl, I uh, initially talked about being like an airline pilot or something, which I think is more just because my dad was an engineer and I knew that he would think that was really cool. So I was like, oh, I'll fly planes. That sounds neat. I'd never been on a plane. Um, <laughs> and there was a little while when I was very, really, really young where I super, super idolized Cindy Crawford and Nikki Taylor. And I was like, I'm going to be a supermodel like them, <laughs> which didn't quite work out. I was never tall enough or like thin enough to do that kind of thing. But it was still nice to, um, to have idols to look up to who are actually like really amazing, strong, cool women. So even if I didn't go down that path, it's a, uh, I, I sometimes get to pretend to be a supermodel when I get to do fancy photos with like my friend Faye and some of the others that I've gotten to do photos with Sal and stuff. So then I get to kind of like, pretend to be a model for a second. Um, do you have any dream roles, whether it's like in musical theater or in opera? Definitely. I have definitely like a, a pretty long list of roles that I'm like, oh man, if that came available, like I would love to be that or do that. Um, of course, at some point I will age out of them if I don't get around to it. <laughs> But, you know, I will also age out of the ability to have a family at some point. So you have to, like, balance it. You're like, okay, well, you know, the family thing's pretty important to me, so I better get on that. Um, but I definitely would love to sing uh, the part of Violetta in La Traviata, which, for those who don't know that show, is the same basic story as Moulin Rouge. Moulin Rouge is, is a, an adaptation, essentially, of La Traviata. It's taken from the same source material. Um, by Dumas, the French novel by Dumas. Um, and so that's definitely, Traviata is really high on the list for me. Um, but like, there are so many opera roles that I would like enjoy doing, like a lot of the Mozart roles and things, or even doing again, like Donna Anna from Don Giovanni. Like I loved singing that part because she's so fiery. Um, and in terms of musical theater, like, I mean, I don't know what role I would be in it for sure, but I, uh, I definitely like love Wicked so much. Like I want to be in it in some way, even if it's like second tree from the left, you know, like I just like love that show. And I know I'm a little tall for a Glinda and I'm more of like not as much a belter, although I work on it. Uh, so I don't know if I'd be uh, an alphabet or not, but I just certainly work at it because it's good for me to try. Um, yes, Madame Morrible, exactly. In a few years, Madame Morrible. Absolutely, Carly, good point. Um, and I've always had um, long-term phantom aspirations for like um, Love Never Dies, Jiri. That's not never been thought. Like, absolutely. Like, love Jiri in Love Never Dies is like, I mean, both series, but Jiri in Love Never Dies, like, yeah. so amazing. Such a pinnacle role. So, yeah, that's just like a smattering. But, you know, like, really, you know, My Fair Lady, Sound of Music, like, so many, so many. Anything Julie Andrews ever sang or considered singing? Probably a safe bet. Um, have you ever had any mishaps on stage? Uh, yes, I seem to have. 
I feel like accidents follow me on stage. <laughs> Very accident prone. I, I'm likely to get stuck on to parts of the set. Um, likely to have my dress rip. Likely to have it not closed for some reason, or it was closed and then it opens. I definitely did um, the entire dressing, or not dressing room, the entire um, hotel block in Love Never Dies with my legs through the wrong part of the skirt. So I was walking around like I was in a kimono because the the train was behind me, but the rest of the dress, like everything was in front of my legs. So I was just like going like this because I was in the wrong part of the skirt. Like I was through the zipper spot. Like, and it was the weirdest thing. I couldn't move at all because it's like, it's like six layers of skirt. So if you get in the wrong one, you're like wrapped tightly. And so I was just like, all around the stage and trying to like run away from the phantom to like the piano and I was like <laughs> like stuff like that happened to me all the time I don't know why I'm so accident prone but yes Mary Poppins as well thank you yes Mary Poppins um I definitely also had my my corset in that not my under corset but the, the dress part with the sleeves open up and just be completely open in the back. But luckily I'm wearing a corset, I'm wearing a bra, but you could see at certain angles, you know, that it's like flapping in the breeze. <laughs> I was like, oh my gosh, why am I so bad accident broke? But that change was more accident from than others because it's like a 30 second costume change. So there's no room for error. So if anything goes wrong, if there's somebody that's new that's never dressed the part before, like on tour, especially we had amazing locals but they were thrown into it you know with like a really quick rehearsal a really quick review on it and then they're doing it you know that night thankfully megan usually got to test them out before i did so i was safe most of the time uh she get you know they could uh, work through it with her i'm sure she loved that um but it definitely meant that there were more we were more prone to mishaps basically <laughs> um Oh, wait. Oh, there we go. <laughs> um, how do you prepare for your roles? So usually if I have a new role that I'm working on, of course, I will have auditioned for it. So I will have some of the material in advance anyway, especially if it's like um, <clears throat> a big part like Christine. They often give you like five different pieces or portions of pieces to learn. So you've already got like a pretty good sense from just the audition process hopefully memorized as well of things that are from the show so that you're like, okay, when I get to the whole score, I don't have to learn everything. Cause I already learned love never dies. I already learned the long duet. I already learned um, the confession scene uh, underground, you know, things like that. So then you're like, okay, like I have things to learn, but it's more like the connective tissue between, you know, how to find the next note because it's a weird one and stuff like that. So for me, when I, I start learning a role, that I've already like auditioned for. It's usually just like sitting down with the whole score and listening through the show, somebody else singing it, if there's an option available um, in the language that I'm singing, which isn't always the case. And just like following along with my score and like trying to lightly sing along and kind of like, okay, get a sense of it, plunk it along where needed if it's weird and I can't quite catch who's singing what because there's lots of parts. Um, and then, my goal is always to be as memorized as possible by the time I hit the rehearsal room, because if those music rehearsals in those first few days can be like fine tuning rehearsals and polishing rehearsals, instead of teaching me my part and my notes and my rhythms, then when we get up to stage it, I'm not likely to make a bunch of mistakes and learn in the wrong things because I'm thinking about something else then. So that's, I think that's, I know a lot of musical theater people are like that as well, but I think that's definitely an opera thing. It's like you show up for an opera rehearsal, a run of operas, and you're like, you get it right in the rehearsals, and it's like you have been memorized, you've been coached within an inch of your life, you know your language stuff, you know your rhythms. Let's get up and stage it almost right away. So I think it comes from that school of thinking, but I, I think a lot of people in musical theater do it as well, especially those who read music so they can like get the score in advance and start teaching themselves. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting, actually. Yeah, it takes a lot of work to learn a new role. And especially when it's one that you've already done and in a different language. It takes a lot of focus to not mix those. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. <clears throat> 
I see. Um, did I get my tapioca today? No, I did not have any bubble tea with tapioca pearls today, unfortunately. I was busy baking a cake for my daughter's birthday, so I, had, I didn't have time to get up and do that. Um, oh yeah. uh, <laughs> how do you prepare for auditions? So with auditions, um, it depends on the audition whether or not they're going to give you any music from the show. So initially, it's a very first round. They usually don't want to hear things from the show. So you have to have your own book of stuff, like a binder that Scott cuts and things like that. Or if it's for an opera, um, you'll bring the entire aria in a binder and you'll have like five arias that you know in their entirety. But if they say, hey, could you start at the second uh, blah, blah, blah in the cabaletta at blah, blah, blah spot, then you're like, oh, uh, yeah, I can start there. Sure. Um, because like they might be running short on time or whatever, but it's not like a firm cut the way that it would be musical theater where they're like, we're expecting to hear 32 bars or 16 bars. Um, so a binder with musical theater cuts would probably have a whole lot more options in it than five. Um, so that you have any flavor they might ask for, you know, especially for shows that you like, there might be lots of parts available and you don't know which one they will be interested in you for. But if you know that you're going for Christine or something, then you'd probably bring, you know, some golden age musical theater. You might bring an aria, especially if it's one of the lighter, beautiful, floaty soprano arias, you know, um, that shows them high notes because you got to have those high notes for Christine. Um, and if you're doing like Carlotta, I always brought um, just arias for Carlotta. I just bring sections of arias that are like really challenging, crazy stuff like all the fireworks, like, <laughs> you know, just like everywhere stuff and things that seem angry just to give them the character. So I, I always brought, um, for Carlotta, I brought Martin a la Arten, which is um, um, basically like martyrdoms of all kinds. Um, and that's, uh, that's from Mozart's Die Entführung aus dem Serail, or the abduction from the Seraglio. So that's a, uh, She's really angry in that scene, that particular character, who's a very lovely character, by the way. Not a mean character, but she's angry and rightfully so because she's been abducted. And uh, and so she just gives him a piece of her mind. And so it's like the perfect, like, especially because I was auditioning for the German production to bring a German aria that was really angry, just seemed really like on the nose. <laughs> so my main thing with audition prep is pick your pieces early, have variety, be really, really prepared because you're less nervous when you're super prepared. And then just like take really good care of your instrument in the week leading up to an audition. So like not drinking and not like staying out late and partying and not like having six hour dramatic phone calls with like friends and family, like just taking good care of your instrument so that when you get to the audition, you're fresh and you're well rested. You have no reason to be worried and you can just go in there. And instead of being like, I have to please these people, you can say, I'm going to enjoy myself singing this beautiful music. And if they like it, great. And if they don't, goodbye. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> we can't please everyone. So I stopped trying a while ago. It, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, wait, I just got lost in all of my questions. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, about preparation. Um, how how do you take care of, uh, sorry, how do you take care of yourself when you're doing such a demanding show? So you kind of have to live like a monk when you're doing something demanding. Like if you're doing Carlotta or soprano ensemble and understudying Carlotta, likely to go on because it, Carlotta's, they, you always have to take off when you're not feeling well. Like you, you can't sing through that role feeling horrible. It's just like the worst idea ever. Um, so in order to like maintain vocally to do that all the time, uh, you pretty much kind of have to like give up your social life largely. Um, so the things I mentioned about before not, you know, auditioning, it's like that, but all the time, you know, keeping track of how you use your speaking voice and how often you do it. Like I'm teaching a ton right now. If I were singing in the show right now, I probably wouldn't be able to maintain the same teaching schedule because it's so much communicating and demonstrating all day long. And so it, it would be very hard to keep up the same level of teaching, I think, 
as my as what my amazing students deserve and uh and get from me if i was having to sing eight shows a week especially if it was eight carlottas oh my gosh like that's like you're like zip <laughs> just don't say anything to anyone ever and between two shows you're like shutting up now yeah like i imagine like i was wondering like how do you actually like when, when you're doing like an opera you're how do you like keep your voice like so i know like well for every show well like, the nice thing with opera is you don't usually do eight shows a week you're usually doing like two shows a week maybe three or four and it's usually like you do like i mean regional operas it's usually like you do like a month of rehearsals and then you do like two to four shows over like a weekend or two weekends um so there's actually quite a bit of time in between performances usually it's usually not more than two in a row day to day to recover because operas are really demanding i find opera to be a lot more demanding than musical theater vocally because you're not like you don't have a microphone so you're not amplified other than your own abilities and so um because you have to sing everything at a slightly higher volume with more cut it's just a more tiring thing to do it's it's you have to use every bit of healthy vocal technique that you possibly can because you can't get away with anything that's like naughty or like hurtful because you will pay for it later um but the other thing is when you are staging operas and musicals you can mark and marking just means you're not singing full out you maybe take it down the octave you're kind of like humming through it a little bit more than full singing so you give it to them at least once or twice full out in that rehearsal and then after that you kind of keep it calm keep it small keep it chill you like take it down the octave you know you know instead of being like ha ah, 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 like, ah, 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 ah. you know you just like keep it calm because you know you're going to have to do it like probably 20 times over and over again as they go oh actually could you move your arm like this and can you throw the scarf a little differently or can you bow a little differently or you know you're going to go over and over and over again so you don't need to like keep selling them on you so you mark you just do the do the chill amount after you've shown them what you can do and then you never mark in the performance obviously then you give it the full that's really oh that makes sense now <laughs> yeah it's much easier to survive that <laughs> <laughs> also uh something that I was actually going to ask you later but you already mentioned it um um I'm like so you you are you're a performer and you also teach lessons so I was wondering like how do you balance your time in like doing a show and like also going to rehearsals and then teaching and yeah everything basically so usually um when i was doing carlotta understudy and the ensemble before covid hit i was probably teaching like two or three lessons a week you know two or three hours of lessons a week which is not very substantial so i was able to balance that now like i said this amount of lessons cuz i'm like i'm a full studio if anybody needs lessons though hit me up cuz after the baby's born i'm going to take a little teeny break and then i'm going to be right back in there and with schools and everything changing schedules changing i do have a couple of slots opening up so for those who might be interested in a regular thing or a once in a while thing i definitely have some slots opening up so um but yeah usually now i'm quite busy with lessons and i know it would be too much this amount of lessons to balance with being in the theater but luckily i have some time off right now i'm going to be focusing mostly on baby for right now i'm on a maternity leave i'm not sure when that's ending so it um it gives me i have some some flexibility there and so um it gives me a lot of time for my students as well as my little one when she arrives i just saw a thing does my husband teach yes he does teach he's like, got an amazing big tenor voice so he kind of bare tenors in the musical theater world like phantom and raoul and things like that and and like um count prolog from dance of the empires and that sort of those sorts of parts but he's a great opera teacher as well <clears throat> although he's more focused admittedly on his software development he is a great teacher um oh, is there any piece of advice you wish you received before joining the arts industry there's probably many um 
I think a lot of lessons I had to learn the hard way. And I think that might just be because of my personality that I um, am one of those people that I'm like, well, I'll believe it when I see it. I'll give it a try and be the one who that doesn't happen to. Um, so it's not that I wasn't like told the lessons, it's that I didn't absorb them, <laughs> which I think is really relatable. We're like, yep, okay, yep, you told me so, got it. Um, but in terms of um, not taking rejection so personally, I think that's a big one. Um, uh, if, if somebody could have instilled, or the future me could have instilled in me back then, not to take rejection personally and not to sit there and try to um, like figure it out in my head why they didn't pick me because it usually has nothing to do with me or whoever got rejected. It usually has everything to do with they saw somebody that walked in and it just, it was obvious they were perfect for the job. And it has nothing to do with the fact that you sang also very well or were super prepared or whatever. I also think that as a young singer, I would tell myself to practice more. Oh my gosh. I was so bad about practicing when I was quite young. And I really wish I could go back and just be like, like that because it makes you so much more nervous if you're not as prepared you're more likely to screw up your words to get lost if it's a repetitive song like let's say love never dies although i never sang that when i was young obviously like you it's so easy to get lost in the words in that if you're not like a hundred thousand percent prepared and there are lots of arias like that like i have specific auditions i remember screwing up because i wasn't prepared enough and i'm like Ooh, like, I still remember which companies, where was the audition, what were they doing that season, what aria did I screw up, because it's just, especially for somebody like me, I think I'm highly distractible. I need, like, to be really, really focused, to remember all of my words and just be positive. I mean, I just know that when I get nervous, words are the first thing to go. Yeah, I feel you. I'm literally the same. <laughs> And like I started um, with a new singing teacher uh, like a few months ago, and like yeah, she's like completely different to like the other ones that I had before, because like the other ones they just it was so weird because they never like put me kind of homework or like things to practice. Yeah, so I was, and this teacher did, and of course I never like I don't know made time for myself to practice and like focus on that, and like the first I remember like that the first um, weeks that I was having the lessons, I was like, I, try, I, I started like practicing the time that she told me to practice like little by little, of course. And, and like, then, then going to the lesson after practicing all of those days, like the improvement was like so crazy. It's so and, fast like, then, my, right? My year, my year was like, I was catching all the notes. I, I was yep. struggling with that, like with the pitch and everything. And then after like doing all that practice and learning to play my keyboard, <laughs> after, nice. like two years of having it, <laughs> um, I managed like to actually like um, do them right. And also like the exercises, like the warm-ups. Yeah. Yeah, because which... the warm-ups, it's like you have to learn all the person's warm-ups too. And so like, I'm always a really big fan of recording voice lessons for that reason, because <laughs> Yeah, Even if the only reason is literally just to sing along with the warm-ups and remember what they are between, like, once or twice in the week or whatever, suddenly mm -hmm. you've got, like, access to this whole, like, library of good warm-ups, you know? And, like, what a like, a, like, a treasure trove in there. Plus, if something happens in a lesson that you're like, oh, my gosh, that felt amazing. I want to, like, duplicate that. What, what was it my teacher said exactly that made me think to do that? And then you go back and you can listen and hear, she said oh, drop the rock or up is down or whatever crazy thing that we teachers will say. I have a whole, like, I have, like, thousands of metaphors um, that, like, that, like, made the light bulb moment happen. So, yeah, that just practicing in between, though, it's amazing what a difference that makes practicing, like, and not, it doesn't have to be, like, hours and hours every day. It's just practicing smart and focused. Yeah. Even if it's yeah. just, like, 15 or I, 20 I mean, or a half hour. Yeah, like, when, like, the, I remember there was a day where I wasn't, I was just like, okay, this is the time where I have to practice. But I wasn't like really, I was like thinking about something else because I think I had a, a test or something the next day or something like that. And I was doing like the, the warm ups like pretty well. I was doing pretty well and everything. And when I, when I did like my practice that day, everything was like so 
weird. Like I couldn't manage like to match the page and that stuff. And then I was like, okay, I'm not gonna do it. Like I literally didn't really practice that day. And I also noticed that when I don't practice because of whatever reason, sometimes I it's because I'm pretty lazy <laughs> and that's something that I should change, of course. Um, but I realized that when I don't practice or there there are some if there's a warm up that I have to do and I don't do it, I notice that I go like back, like instead of like going forward. Like, yeah, totally. Like, like the really progression like will stop for you. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah. I mean, like I said, I was I'm not one to be like, you need to practice, but I I definitely needed to have practiced more when I was younger. And I'm very grateful for teachers who would sometimes call me out on it because I needed it. To, I needed to be called it. It still hurt. I was like, oh, it's uncomfortable. I hate being called out. I'm such a people pleaser. Um, but it was very valuable to get those lessons as well because in the long run, that is being really well prepared is the thing that makes the difference between professional level and not professional level. Being really well prepared, you walk into an audition, you know your stuff, you feel good about it, you know what you're gonna hear from the pianist when they play because you've listened to it enough times. So you're not phased if they screw up a note or like skip a measure or something. You're like, oh, they skipped a measure. Okay, I'm gonna be skipping as well. Let's go on together. You know, like you're just better, you're better equipped for whatever shenanigans might actually occur, so. Yeah. <laughs> Um, are there any um, actors or performers or directors that you like to work with? Um, yes, definitely. Um, like, I've never done anything by Sondheim. And like, I would love to do some of his work. I would love to meet him, work with him, know him. Um, Stephen Schwartz, like, there are so many. I mean, of course, lots of the people that I'm like, oh, I wish I could have worked with that person are also like passed on because I like have all these like old, old musicals that I like love. But but um, yeah, no, definitely. There are a lot of uh, actors and directors that I haven't worked with yet because I've primarily been in Andrew Lloyd Webber shows so far, the Lord. Um, and so uh, and he is so lovely to work with, by the way, and to coach with. He is such a lovely human to work with. Um, coaching with him on Love Never Dies in Germany, and then again, um, uh, in preparation for some of the publicity stuff uh, before the tour was just such a special, special opportunity. I was like, I can't believe I'm in the same room as this person. It's very easy to get starstruck. <laughs> so, it, and like, I've met people that were starstruck by me, and then I'm like, but I'm also starstruck by people too. Like, I'm just, I'm just like you guys. Like, I'm such a fan girl of um, of certain shows and certain um, composers and directors and stuff that I can't help myself. So, but I don't. Uh, I try to be cool when I meet them. That's what I'll say. I try to be cool. I don't know if I actually come off as cool because I'm an awkward human, but I, I try. <laughs> um. What is your um, favorite part about performing? My favorite part about performing is um, when you're done with the rehearsal process and you're like actually in the theater and you've got the audience and stuff, the feeling that like each performance that you're experiencing everything with the audience as they experience it for the first time. So many of them anyway, not always. Obviously there are people that come back to um, to Phantom lots of times and things like that or Wicked or whatever show one might be in. Um, Hamilton, if you can afford it all the time. Uh, but like, even so, there are always people in there that have never seen it. They don't know what they're get in for. And then when something exciting happens on stage and you just feel the audience go, oh, you know, like they're like, it's such a like communication experience between the actors and the audience as you take them on that journey that like that part of it is my favorite is just feeling the energy flow and change in the room as things change on stage you can feel the audience reacting really palpably like the end of love never dies when the gun goes off the feeling of the people who had never seen that show and were not expecting that coming it's like bottle that and sell it. It's the most amazing feeling ever to be like, yeah, you didn't know that was coming, huh? Like, it's so fun. <laughs> it, makes, it makes dying on stage so much more fun. <clears throat> Let's um, see. What would, be, what would be for you the hardest part of being a performer? 
Um, for me, the hardest part is, uh, is being away from my family when I have to be away. So like when I was on tour, being away from my daughter and my husband for long chunks of time. Now, part of the reason I took the Love Never Dies tour was because the way it was set up, there were lots of times where the truck was driving across the country or truck. It was like 14 trucks or something. The trucks were driving across the country, bringing the set. So we had like a week off or two weeks off. So I felt like I could balance that with my family life a little better than some of these tours that they move, but not super far. And so then they're, they don't, they'll sit down for like four months and then they'll move. And that would have been really hard in my situation, just with my daughter, like she needs to be at school in her main school and not moving around and homeschooled and stuff. Um, so it worked out really well to be on Love Never Dies, but it was still a real sacrifice to be away from her so much at that time and away from my husband and stuff. And it's like, of course, more so with kids because they're growing so quickly and changing all the time. But with spouses too, even after a long, long time, 10 long years, no, uh, after a long time of being married, you still like really, really miss that day-to-day -day interaction. So for me, that's been the hardest part is all the traveling when I have to be away from my family. But luckily that hasn't been the case for a little while because uh, since I got settled down with Phantom here in New York, I've been, we've all been together all the time, which has been really, really, really lovely. Um, I have some questions on here. Um, there are questions on the question box and also like on the comments. Yeah. So let me go through the comments first. <laughs> okay, perfect. Um, let me see. There are like so many. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, um, what is your favorite memory of the Phantom production in, I hope I'm pronouncing this right, Hamburg? Hamburg? Yes, yeah, in Hamburg. Um, oh my gosh, there were so many wonderful moments in that show. You know what? One of my favorite memories, and this is so like not specific, but it was more of just like the culture of that cast and and that show, was um sitting backstage with everybody like that wasn't on stage in the hallway we had all these little chairs set up and stuff and there was like never enough chairs and people were like draped over each other just like <clears throat> you know just like as they would come and go and they're like oh, okay i gotta go do my entrance or whatever um just like that camaraderie of like having like all these different conversations in different languages because the doors were closed to the stage area so we didn't have to be super duper quiet i mean we couldn't be like ah, ha, ha, you know but like we could definitely have like normal conversations and like my Dutch friends were all like, <laughs> like just speaking in Dutch. And I was like understanding half of it because it's similar to German and like my German friends are talking and there's some Italians there. And, like we're just all like this like crazy, ridiculous international family, just like having a party backstage. And then like, Oh, I got to go on for my entrance. You know, like, or Muskenball. So I like think that for me, that was like probably my favorite thing about Hamburg was just because the backstage was so roomy that behind the stage, behind the set, you know, I, there was just this hugely wide hallway. It was like six or eight feet wide where people could sit in chairs and chat and have like all this camaraderie and then like take that to up to the cantina, which is like a little cafeteria with like fresh foods made every day. Um, and like between shows and everybody's always hanging out. So I just like loved the culture of that Hamburg production because it was just like this like brand new family that just got like tossed together first day of school kind of feeling. And then just like gelled and clicked and we all hung out all the time. And it was such a fun cast. So that's my favorite memory. I know that's not like a specific on stage one, but it was really, really fun. <laughs> um, let me see. Um, There were so many questions on here. Um, I'm trying to like see which ones. You I tried to answer a couple as we went past them, but I didn't know if we'd get to them otherwise. Uh, how many weeks do you recommend to prepare for a single audition? Um, usually you don't get a lot of luxury of time with auditions. Uh, in Germany, you get a little bit more time. Like you might find out like three weeks before that you're going to move on to the next round and so you have a few weeks to like learn all your stuff but certainly in new york things are like super fast paced so you probably get like 
five to 10 days max. Sometimes you get like three days of notice. Your agent's like, hey, can you go in on a Friday? And it's already like a Tuesday and you're like, ah, ah, what am I saying? Um, which is why it's so important to have a book that's already established with cuts of all sorts of things because that way you at least have some things that you feel really confident and already prepared with so you don't have to come up with your own stuff. Only if they give you sides or sheet music cuts from the show then you can focus on those sides, speaking sides or singing sides. Um, so it, yeah, you don't usually have the luxury of time in New York. It's a fast paced world. It's a New York minute. Do you have any advice for trying to roll your R's or is it just something that only certain people can do? <laughs> it is definitely something that many people can do, but some people cannot do from a genetic standpoint. So I wouldn't say it's an absolute, like everybody can learn to roll their R's because I absolutely know, I literally know Italian people that can't, genetically cannot roll their R's. It's unusual, but I do know um, a small handful. Um, but what I would say is most everybody could flip an R even if they can't roll one, but it takes time to learn it. So it's a, like a real process to learn how to, uh, 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 versus, uh, 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 so I would say if you can't roll your R's, learn to flip them at least. And then you can get away with doing that because the only time you really need to like strongly roll an R anyway in like Italian stuff or things like that is like, well, at least in Italian is when you have doubled R's. Like vorrei, okay. But if you were like morir, like it's just one R in between morir. It's like an inner vocalic one R between two vowels and just one R. You're not supposed to go, Marir. you know, it's like, it sounds really like kind of disgusting and overdone. So yeah. most of the time you need to be able to flip them. So if you can get away with just flipping them, you're already doing enough probably to get away with it, unless you're like probably working in Italy. And then you probably need to be able to flip them, roll them and flip them and, you know, somersault them and whatever else. <laughs> Well, for me, it's easy like to roll my R because we use it in Spanish. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Words, Spanish so. singers are not usually having a struggle. But like I said, it is genetically sometimes impossible for certain people. So it is possible for a Spanish person to not be able to roll their R's. It, they would just essentially have a speech impediment. And it would be harder for them with that. And then that might not be something that they would... It might be too much of a source of frustration to be working and focusing on that. They'd be like, I'm going to go to a country where I don't have to roll my R's all the time. I'm going to America. <laughs> uh, what is your best advice on how to prepare uh, to build out a powerful note, like in music of the night, to like hear you sing, Lone or Dies? Um, so getting a really powerful note out is an interesting uh, question. So sometimes when we sing with a lot of work behind it, we feel like it's going to be super powerful because I'm working so damn hard. I'm like, Arr! but actually the, it's kind of like with the practicing thing I talked about before that you actually have to work smarter and not harder. So in order to sing a really powerful note, you have to do a lot of letting go. You can't be grabbing a lot. And then it has to come from, well, here, <laughs> from here. And so you're going to feel like you almost have a disconnect in between where there's a section that you're not utilizing and not trying to engage. Like you're like, I will not engage this middle section. I'm only going to engage down low and out so that it's kind of like, bah! like in one place, out one, the other and skip all the middle stuff. But that takes a lot of training admittedly to do it. So I would say my best advice on how to, tr to prepare that kind of thing is to, allow your vocal mechanism to relax and work with a really good teacher on getting your support underneath you so that it does all the work instead of the vocal mechanism. Because if it's not working, if it's not doing the work, this one wants to support instead. And this one's really bad at supporting. This is like the tiniest muscles ever. They're like absolutely crap at supporting. You want the big boys, you want the abdominal wall, the diaphragm, all of that to do the hard lifting. Um, I could go on how, for days about that. <laughs> uh, how did you feel the first time you stepped on a stage? Okay, I have to think back to the first time I stepped on a stage. 
the very first time that I remember stepping on a stage, um, I was in the second grade and the performing bug bit me so hard. I was like, I have to do this. This is so fun. So I would say, uh, because I was so young, I um, am kind of a extroverted, outgoing person. I took to it really quickly. And so for me, the, the experience of first stepping onto a stage was like, like a duck to water. I was like, oh my gosh, I have to be doing this. And I was just like in a kid's choir singing with my mom's, um, my mom sings in this uh, community-based choir. My mom has a beautiful voice actually. Um, <laughs> I get my singing from her. Um, and she, uh, she was singing uh, with the choir of the sound, which is in the Puget Sound area in Seattle, in the greater Seattle area. And they had the kids come and sing with the choir um, for Christmas concert and I got out there with my sister and we were singing and it was really interesting because I talked to my sister about it later and she was like yeah I didn't enjoy that so much I was really nervous and I was like I love that like like for me I was just like hamming it up so I think um, yeah I would say that I um, I felt really 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 at home on stage it felt like a good fit <clears throat> um which is your favorite character of all the ones that you played? And you're amazing. <laughs> um, I would say, honestly, Christine in Love Never Dies is still my absolute favorite. And I think it's just because she's so close to who I am as a person that it like, when I play her on stage, it feels like a, like a homecoming, like I'm coming home to like some a part of me that I know really well. And like, I get really a sense of, um, it's sort of like a, a really cool way of like living outside of your body, but then kind of also still experiencing your same circumstance to some degree. Obviously I'm not, nobody's shooting me and I'm not in a crazy love triangle, but in terms of like having lost my dad, having a child that I would do anything for those kinds of things, you know, my daughter is 10. So like, I feel like when I play her, when I play Christine, I feel like, super super at home and so she's my favorite because of that it just it feels like 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 it fits like a glove mm -hmm. um how do you control dynamics while singing that's a good question so every instrument has its own way of controlling dynamics of course um and in singing generally speaking the more flow you put through the more like air that you flow through the vocal mechanism the louder it will be not that it's going to sound breathy but that there's just literally more to, more power behind it so if i only allow a little bit of flow i'm going to demonstrate now like a little teeny 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 bit of flow just it's going to come out quite quiet if i take that exact same relaxed space but instead add quite a bit more air suddenly same exact I didn't change anything about my spacing all I did was apply more of this and just went with the air and just let it flow out so kind of like if you were playing like uh, an accordion and you went like zoop, together it puts out more air puts out more sound so I know it's different with different instruments violin might be more about pressure with the bow uh Piano would be more like more your fingers are pressing down harder or something um, initially. And like you couldn't necessarily get louder as you go unless it's like a tremolo or something, you know. Uh, but uh, that sounds really strange on a major chord. There we go. That's better with minor. Um, but but with the voice, of course, you get that choice. So you just apply more air when you apply more flow when you're ready to like unleash the beast. Yeah, I've got some of my opera friends are joining. <laughs> Hi, my opera friends. Lydia, Rocky, love you. Um, someone said that they missed uh, the view of the baby bump. <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me give you some more baby bump. Here we go. Here's the baby bump. There she is in all of her glory. She's hanging out. She's making it very hard to breathe these days. 
or sit upright. Like you might notice I'm like leaning back a lot because I have a pillow back here that's really comfortable. I'm not sitting on a piano bench at my piano because the piano bench, it just, it requires me to use my abdominal muscles constantly to hold myself upright. And my abdominal muscles are like off to the sides while pregnant. They're like, we're not doing that. <laughs> yeah, like I was wondering like when you did those concerts while pregnant, I was like, how does she have like all these, um air support and everything like I was I will say <laughs> the one where I was seven months pregnant in Ocean City I definitely just breathed more often at some point I was like I can get through this phrase but it hurts if I do it to that degree because I'm just like compressing the baby and I was like you know what I'm just gonna take a breath there and it'll be fine sometimes you have to like balance you know it's not a hill to it's not a hill that's worth dying on we say in english like i i could just take the extra breath you know if i'm that pregnant you know when i'm not pregnant i wouldn't take a breath there but you know what i'm pregnant and i'm not going to worry about it um oh, about like my kind of opera questions that i have for you they're yeah. like pretty simple actually um i was wondering like if you have any uh like favorite operas or an opera that you would recommend someone to watch I haven't yeah. watched many so I was wondering like if you have any recommendations. Yeah absolutely okay so for people who haven't watched a lot of opera I think La Boheme is probably one of the very best ones to start with because the music is really really engaging there's a, it's got like really beautiful scenes there's a like really good variety of types of characters like the more earnest characters like Mimi and Rudolfo, and then the sort of fiery, sassy relationship between Marcello and Musetta. You know, she's very, like, high maintenance, which is really fun. Although she actually does show some real um, genuine character traits uh, later in the show uh, when Mimi starts being really ill. But, but even so, like, it's like there's kind of something for everybody in that show. Uh, so I would highly recommend Bohème. It's not a show I've been in, but I would love to be in. I would probably be more of a Musetta than a Mimi. Mimi sits a little lower and Musetta's got the coloratura thing, so it makes more sense. I don't know. I could see them casting me as a fiery, sassy person. I don't know. I just feel like I could see that. Um, Traviata, of course, I mentioned before, like dream role, Violetta. Um, and I definitely think that that is a very engaging opera in terms of the beauty of the show the luxuriousness of the costume. So for those looking for that like grand opera experience, you're gonna find it there. And then things like, um, so I'm, I'm very much a Puccini and Verdi kind of person. So those are Puccini and then Verdi. Also Aida, which is Verdi, I love Aida. It's got some of the most famous pieces in it. Um, and, and it's just so, so, so engaging. And it's got that interesting love triangle thing of like, these two love each other, but this person's in love with him as well. And so she's trying to like screw with things and it's, it doesn't go well as a result, you know, that sort of thing is the, uh, I like those sorts of plots. So some, and, and there are operas that are funnier or fun. I admit that I'm more drawn to the like really dramatic ones where people are dying and jumping off of precipices and faking their own deaths and, and, uh, just crazy romance scenes and stuff like that. Like I just love, you know, like Romeo and Juliet, the opera by Gounod is just like exquisitely beautiful, especially like the morning after they've gotten married and they wake up together. Like the music of that is just, it's some of the best music ever written in my opinion. So, oh yes, yeah, Carmen, duh, duh. Somebody wrote Carmen. Of course, Carmen. Yes, Carmen. I've been in Carmen actually. Carmen's amazing. It's also really dark though. And it does, having watched it again more recently, not live because COVID, but on, on the computer, I will say it does kind of get into a sticky territory, which a lot of operas do of this like really like unhealthy relationship between the female and the male characters where it's like, she doesn't want to be with him anymore. And then he stabs her. Like it just, <laughs> it feels like it gets into a weirdly um, possessive relationship thing. And I realized how flawed the characters are when I watched it again. I was like, Ooh, Ooh, this is like, this gets into some like ugly territory there. So, <laughs> you know, but Carmen's amazing and it's got, it's so recognizable. So for people that have not seen opera before, you'll see it and then be like, Oh, I know that piece. I've heard that piece too. Ooh. And then you feel like more like 
familiar. And so you're like, oh, I know some pieces from opera already. Look at me. <laughs> yeah, La Boheme was actually like the first opera that, well, I saw it like online, of course. Uh, the first opera that I saw. And I got like really obsessed with it. <laughs> that I even asked my parents to buy me like the, like, the, the script of the of the opera like with the songs and everything yeah like the libretto <laughs> dialogue and everything and they found it on here which is like so weird to find that kind of stuff in my country and i've got it actually here um, oh i love that it's really cool oh so beautiful with the music and everything Oh, that's really amazing. amazing yeah it's just it's one of the best and my husband sang in in bohem and i always just watching him in that show, I was just like as proud as you can imagine. Like we were like still kind of newlyweds too. So I was like, that's my husband. <laughs> um, and he was amazing. I was like, that's my husband kissing somebody else. No, I'm just kidding. Um, because, you know, he's playing Marcello. So he's like a like, romantic thing with Musetta. But it was fine because the Musetta is amazing. She's wonderful and I love her. <laughs> and also, I love uh, Musetta, like that character. I don't know. I just, she's iconic. She's like she's so, so amazing. Extra in every way. Yeah, I love she's like Carlotta. She's like Carlotta. I feel like in some ways, in a really in the fun ways, she's extra in the fun ways, like Carlotta is, and also doesn't deserve to have the set thrown on her. Ben Crawford. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, have I been also, in the no, triumphal no. march from Aida? Uh, no, I've never been in Aida. My husband has been in Aida. I've never been in Aida, unfortunately. I would definitely be happy to be in it at any time. Um, let me see if I have like any more questions on here. Um, I, I was going to ask you something else, and now I completely forgot. What I'm sorry, I threw you off. <laughs> Like I said, I'm really distractible. If I see questions, I just go, and I just start answering them if I see them, if I can help that. Oh, yeah. Um, do you have, like, a favorite aria to sing that you love singing? Yes. I One of my very favorite arias to sing is um, Ach Ich Fuß from um, The Magic Flute, the Zauberflöte, because um, it's, like, it seems kind of straightforward on paper. It's, like, Bram, Bram, Ach Ich Fuß, da, 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 da. It seems so straightforward, but it's actually kind of a beast to sing because it's all so sort of floaty sad the whole time that in order to maintain the control to be like, like to still have that like ready to go and not give it all away at the beginning or like lose your pacing. It's like, it takes a lot of like vocal and mental emotional control to keep yourself from accidentally like, you know, like by the time you get there because you're like, it's so, it could be so big just before that. So like, I like that aria because it's actually so challenging in that it's so like refined. Um, but sometimes it's fun to just throw down and sing something that's really, really like raucous and big and, and fun. So like, um, like I mentioned Martin Aller Arten, um, from Mozart's um, Abduction from the Seraglio, that is a fun aria to sing. I mean, don't get me wrong. It's kind of scary because it's like 12 pages long. And at the end, there's... And then do it all again. And you go... So it's like... <laughs> As much as you pace the entire beginning of the aria, the end page, the two pages at the end are just like, just like a bat out of hell. It's like so out of nowhere, I feel like. And it's got like low notes and, you know. So um, that's really fun to sing as long as you're super in voice and feeling really good. I don't sing it often because it's not one that orchestras, like if you're getting engaged to play, you know, sing something. It's not usually one that they have uh, the music for like randomly like oh yeah yeah we play that all the time because it's like kind of demanding for the orchestra as well because Mozart is insanely demanding and if, if, yeah. if the soprano is doing something demanding probably the orchestra is too it's not like something like um ba ba um ba ba um ba ba no they're like <laughs> and the bass is like ah! you know so it's kind of a free-for-all but I think that's why I like it and I actually sang it in a concert in Germany once um 
I think the recording's out there on YouTube. And the, the pianist and I hadn't worked together much before, and, and he really didn't speak any English. And um, I spoke German, but he spoke like Schwabian German. And so we didn't understand each other very well. And at the very end, he, he went so fast, I could barely breathe. I could barely keep up. It was the fastest I've ever done the ending of Martin Arlo Arden in my life. If you find the recording, you can laugh because I'm just like hanging on for dear life. You know, you imagine like somebody like riding a horse, but they're like hanging off of it, like by the hair, like ah, as the horse is like galloping away. That's basically what it felt like. Yeah, like Mozart, I, I really love Mozart. <laughs> like all of his pieces are like so amazing. But they are so challenging. Sometimes yeah. I'm like so surprised when I see like um, opera singers like doing his pieces and everything. I'm just like, how? Like how do they? Yeah, do how do so they do it? Perfectly? Yeah. Well, and you know what? The thing with Mozart is you have to know which Mozarts are for you, and which Mozarts are for another singer. So like, I could do Martin Arlo Arden, but there are other pieces that Mozart wrote that I need to stay away from because those are not for me. And if I try to sing them with my size of voice or my color of voice, I, I, it's like a losing battle to begin with. So you have to find your right Mozart, you know, like the right piece of Mozart for you instead of trying to wear all of them at the same time. Cause they're not all for the same. They're all for totally different voice types. So mm -hmm. moral of the story is know your Fach. F-A-C-H, which means your voice classification, so that you can just focus on the ones that are just right. Mm -hmm. um, what else I was going to ask you? <laughs> Mozart <laughs> equals pain. I just saw that. <laughs> Mozart does equal pain, especially if you get in the wrong vein with it as you're singing and you just feel like you leave your larynx on the floor. Like, man. <laughs> Thanks. That'll be all, folks. <laughs> Oh, if you could perform anywhere in the world, where would it be? Um, ooh, that's a good question. Well, like, obviously, I love returning to places I've already performed because I always already know the vibe. Um, like, going back to Hamburg would be so nice at some point. I love it so much there. I miss my, like, Hamburg audiences and the vibe of that city. But there are so many cities that I really, really like, like Paris and Venice and... And um, and also cities in the U.S. that like I'm like, oh, it'd be so fun to like have an excuse to go there and sing like, you know, oh, I've seen a show there and the house, the opera house is really beautiful. Like in Venice, the La Fenice is such a beautiful theater and uh, and it'd be so cool to get to sing there someday, you know, never gotten the chance or like the Palais Garnier in Paris, which is the story of where fandom comes from like that would be so cool to sing there and that ceiling is so beautiful with all of its colors and stuff like i just love inspiring spaces to sing in so that would be really really nice to return and and in return but actually singing something there mm -hmm. you know fun fact uh, like, this is very random but anyways um like the other day on um arts history class we actually like studied a little bit about I don't know how to pronounce it, like, in the right way. But, like, the opera house of, like, the Phantom, let's say, like that. Um, yeah. And we have here a theater that is called Teatro Solis. And the teacher told us that they, like, the, 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 the okay, the people who, who did the theater, um, they got inspired by that opera house to oh, do the theater. Wow. So it's, like, pretty similar to that opera so yeah oh well there we go but then i'll also be happy to sing in teatro sole then as well <laughs> because if it's beautiful like that i'm interested <laughs> <laughs> i think uh, it's like the most beautiful theater that we've got here and like the only one that it's okay like the rest of them are like pretty bad like they are like very destroyed and everything oh yeah like not not maintained in the same way you know what is actually a really beautiful theater that i've sung in was the the tennessee state theater in knoxville tennessee that is a beautiful theater speaking of beautiful ceilings and beautiful painting and everything it is so fun they did right before i got to ut like in the five years before i got to university of tennessee and was singing out there um they did like a like 
$25 million restoration or something like that. I, I could be messing up the numbers on that theater. And it is just so pretty. And so when I got to sing Mabel there, I was like, you, I mean, online, you see the, the video of me singing up there and it's a pretty set and stuff. But just imagine that I'm looking out at the audience and being like, this is the most beautiful theater ever. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm singing here. And I felt the same with the, um, the Fox Theater in Atlanta. It was so pretty. That's a gorgeous, gorgeous theater. And like seats like 5,000 people. It's crazy. Oh, here's a question. Uh, 33 and dreaming of playing Phantom. What's the age range usually for the Phantom Christina Rowell? So each one of those has their own special age range. A lot of Rowells go on to become the Phantom because Rowell tends to be a younger part. Usually most Rowells are, are under 30, 30 or less, or maybe 35 or less especially if they have a baby face, you know. Um, but phantoms tend to start at that age, largely, 35 and over. So it's a good way to graduate, like people like Gardar, uh, who sang uh, Love Never Dies with me in, in, in Germany, and then again in, in uh, the U.S. Um, he started as a Raoul on the West End. He was a Raoul in the West End, and then he, in the 25th, anniversary production at Royal Albert Hall. He was like Pasarino or something. And then he went on to sing as the Phantom in Love Never Dies. And then he was supposed to do it for Phantom, the, uh, you know, Phantom in Paris. And then, of course, as Phantom in Love Never Dies again, because it's like a Love Never Dies sandwich. Um, so, like, luckily, those ones kind of go together because you could go from one to the other. They're both kind of in the baritone range tenor, but baritone. Like, there's some good low notes in, in Music of the Night. That's got some low notes in it. So I saw a question about bass. Yes, bass playing the Phantom. Definitely um, a bass could play the Phantom. The key is just making sure that the top is free enough to be able to get away with it well. Uh, the Christine age range is a little younger these days than it was maybe, say, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so I think the ideal range for a Christine is usually like right out of college or like if she goes to college, because sometimes we have these like ones that are very, very young, 19 or 21 or whatever. Um, so kind of like nine, between like 19 and like 30 is probably the ideal age range for a Christine, especially more so towards the younger unless she's very petite or has like, again, a baby face because they, you want that dichotomy, that sort of father kind of figure, like how the phantom, how Christine leans in on the phantom's advice because she's missing her dad. And so you get this sort of really weird dichotomy, like the, it's a weird relationship um, dynamic and it works better if he's a lot older than her to get that dynamic. It's like, ooh, creepy. <laughs> Um, there's another question here that says, uh, there are operas in many languages. Have you or your husband never sung any in Spanish? So I've never sung any operas in Spanish, but I've definitely sung song cycles because, uh, when we're doing recital work, um, like recitals, when you're doing like a music degree as a, like getting a bachelor of music or master of music, you always need to put together you one or two recitals usually as part of that degree. And uh, I did three during my undergrad, although I only was required to do two. And then I did one for my master's. Um, and I like, often like to pr put a, a song cycle of, you know, four to six songs that are Spanish. So like uh, one of my recitals, I did um, a song cycle by Joaquin Rodrigo. And like, it was really, really fun to do that kind of music because it doesn't sound like any of the, it like has its own like special sound print. It's like a thumbprint. It just sounds so uniquely Spanish. It was so beautiful. And like, it was a real favorite from the program. So I wouldn't say I'm an expert with Spanish repertoire, but uh, I've always enjoyed it when I fit that onto a program because it, it is similar enough to Italian that it's not totally, totally foreign. It's not like me trying to sing in Russian. I leave that to my husband because he's, he's a fluent Russian speaker, but <laughs> it's not like me trying to like get my way through Russian. I feel like I have a better chance with Spanish. So yeah, it, Spanish is lovely to sing in. Yeah, I, I, I think I don't know like any operas in Spanish. Like I've never, I've never heard of any of them actually. Yeah, but there's a lot of Zarzuela like songs that you can use. Like yeah. sometimes you get competitions that are like you can bring opera arias, operetta, and Zarzuela, and you can bring those three as like, and so like you still get a chance to sing big classical 
dramatically fun pieces. They're just maybe not in a traditional opera. Mm -hmm. Although I feel like yeah. Carmen should be, but you know, it's written by a French composer. So you get Bizet was like, uh, let's make it in French. En français. <laughs> Um, let me see if I have any more questions for you. Like, I don't want to take more of your time. Um, <laughs> but yeah, well, like, basically, the last question that I always ask everyone is that if you have any advice for anyone who would like to be a performer in the future. So my best advice for those who want to perform is to seek out opportunities as much as you can. And when there, you're not finding a lot of opportunities for yourself, to create the opportunities. So if that means like, oh, you know, like that, nobody's hiring me to do a recital, but I'm going to put one together anyway. I'm going to find a pianist. I'm going to learn repertoire and bother to go through the process of learning this because then later on, if you've done that, if, if you actually need to do it for your career, then you feel like really, really capable because you've already done that before. You know, if you, you know, like I did that when I was in high school, I put together like a recital. And then when I got to college and had to do it, it was like, okay, I know what to do because I've already done this. It was a joint recital when I was in high school, but then, okay, so I've already done half of a recital before I know how to plan that. So my advice is to seek out or create your own opportunities as much as possible when you're young and, um, and don't just wait for opportunities to fall into your lap. Um, and then to be as prepared as possible and always practice because that's the advice that I should have <laughs> given myself. So always practice more than you think you need to. Not so much all vocally, but like listening to your piece over and over again, following along in the music, like flunking it out, all the different ways that you could practice, writing down the, like typing out the words so you get them really good. So practice, practice, and a little more practice. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rachel, for your time and answering all of these questions. Um, you bet. Literally for everything. <laughs> like, I had a great time chatting with you about, like, literally everything. So, yeah, thank you so much for your time once again. <laughs> thank you. And hopefully in the next three weeks, we'll have a baby in this family, a new opera singer to bring into the family since you know part of fan fam so have a good one thanks everybody for joining us and thank you for your wonderful questions hope you have a lovely night you bye. too bye bye <laughs>